Uh, our sponsor today uh, is uh, NewBalanceChicago.com. They're going to be here with us for just a few more shows uh, with uh, seven, I think, locations here in Chicago. There might be six now or eight. I'm not sure. I haven't been keeping track. But um, they've got a couple more sponsorships here. They've got great shoe companies. Uh, most of their stores have been through our National Shoe Fit program. That's something that you can find on our website underneath the store um, tab. If you want to kind of up your store in terms of getting your people to really understand shoe fit and understand that there's really not three foot types, pronators, supinators, and neutral, something we talk about in depth today on the podcast about the the five plus foot types. Um, if you really want to get your shoe store fitters up on what's going on and so you can understand why every shoe has some unique things to it, that's a program for you. We go through the foot anatomy, we go through foot types, we go through shoe anatomy, we talk about footbeds and orthotics and wedges and postings and stuff like that and how to bring it all together to understand what shoe is good for your client because frankly each shoe has got a purpose. They are not all the same otherwise we would only have five types of shoes uh, or maybe even five shoes period but um, each company has their own little piece of technology and beware consumers and shoe store owners and everybody when you put something else in the shoe, you change the way that shoe was designed. So whether it's uh, a footbed that's sold in the stores, you know, Superfeet, or there's a whole bunch of other companies out there. These things have value, but you have to know what they're for. But as soon as you put something like that into a shoe, you change the way that shoe works. Remember, the problem is not the shoe. It's not the orthotic. It's not the footbed. It's the person in the shoe. They're the ones that bring the pathology. The shoe doesn't change. The shoe is designed for a purpose. You need to figure out what that person's problem is functionally and figure out what shoe they need. And if you can't find the shoe that they need, you might actually um, try some of these extra, extra devices. But beware, you don't fix the problem. You are basically creating an environment to m mitigate the problem. We talk about that in the podcast here today. So New Balance Chicago, why did I mention that? Well, these guys have a lot of different shoes and they keep improving their shoe line. They've got uh, widths of shoes, uh, varying widths of shoes that most shoe companies do not have. Um, and they're always putting out new innovative products. And we can't say anything bad about New Balance. I don't think anybody can for the past 20, 30 years. And they've certainly kind of upped the ante here and their game in the last decade and really have kind of come right back up into the top of the R&D research and design in our opinion. So check out NewBalanceChicago.com with a shoe store in your neighborhood here in the Chicagoland area and certainly online as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're thanking them for their sponsorship. Enough jibber jab. Let's get on with the podcast. Uh, we'll throw up a little band music here for you, and we'll see you on the other side for a rather in depth conversation on foot types and the biomechanical faults and problems and benefits that go with these things, how to get around them. It's a bit of a mental soup today, but um, you may have to listen to this one twice because I have when I uh, go pretty deep down into a few rabbit holes here and discover all kinds of different pathways of thinking on these types of things. So we'll see you guys on the other side. Thanks for being with us as always. We love you guys. Talk to you soon. back for another podcast number 123 here on the gate guys podcast sean allen speaking to you on this side of the uh, country from uh, chicago illinois and we've got good old dr ivo Werlop out there in Dillon, colorado on the other end so <clears throat> we've been having um, a good week we had our uh, a couple posts and we also had some online ce this week over at uh, onlinece.com continuing education and this week we did the rear foot and we had a great turnout why do you think people, um, you know, we always announce these things early on on social media and for some reason this one just grabbed people and we had a, a, a filled room. Why do you think this one was so interesting? you have any thoughts? I was wondering that myself when we were doing it. I think 
it's because we were talking about foot types. And I think, and this is just, again, me pontificating, but I think that when people think about foot types, one, they find it a little confusing and daunting because I remember way back when this was, gosh, four or five years ago when we did the National Shoe Fit Program and we were going down to Texas to speak at uh, the running event. And you said, oh, we're going to do a talk on foot types. And I was like, really? Like, we've never really talked about foot types before. <laughs> it's like, okay, we can do it. And, uh, you know, we managed to do it really well. Um, but but the point is, I, I think people are a little confused about that. Because, you know, there's five basic foot types that we've talked about. You know, there's the neutral or ideal foot, where the forefoot to rear foot relationship is basically neutral. There's no difference. There's forefoot varus, where the forefoot is inverted with respect to the rear foot. There's forefoot valgus, where the forefoot is everted with respect to the rear foot. Then there's rear foot varus, where the rear foot is inverted with respect to the forefoot. And rear foot valgus, where it's everted with respect to the forefoot. And we talked only about rear foot, which was a treat because we were able to talk a lot on the pathology and the gait and really get into the videos. So rather than trying to blow through a bunch of material and cover it superficially, we went fairly in depth. Mm -hmm. The second reason I think, yeah, the second reason I think people really liked it is because if you're like me, I'm a very linear guy, very linear in my thinking. And foot types provides a construct. In other words, it's like, oh, all feet are going to fall into one of five categories, basically. Mm -hmm. So from there, each category is going to have certain characteristics and those characteristics are going to help me to know, one, what's wrong, and then, two, what I need to do about it. And I think we have a lot of linear thinking people that listen to the gate guys. I mean, come on, you're going to sit here and listen to us talk about, like, neurology and biomechanics, and we care about torque curves of muscles and, you know, forces and things like that. You've got to be pretty geeky to be into that kind of stuff. So I think folks dig that, and I think that that's why we had a, a pretty big crowd, and I'm sure when we do forefoot, um, we'll have a big crowd as well because it's just um, – it's information that's really germane. Mm -hmm. the, um, <clears throat> I think that's a really good point. And we should mention that uh, – and we did discuss this in the, uh, the lecture that forefoot supinatus is probably more important, more appropriate than forefoot varus. Forefoot varus being kind of a uh, – more of a unicorn out there, whereas forefoot supinatus is more of a, uh, an appropriate um, description for what <clears throat> most of the forefoot types are out there. That being said, well, go ahead. Right. No, just uh, exactly. Four foot, a true four foot varus is very rare. Um, you know, I don't know the exact statistics. I'm sure Craig Payne could give us the exact statistics on it, but pretty rare. But four foot supinatus is much more accurate. But but we didn't talk about that. We talked about rear foot this time, right? Yeah. Which, um, yeah, which is pretty common. I mean, we see a lot of people with rear foot valgus type deformities and things like that. So. It would be maybe good to kind of talk to people just a little bit of maybe about normal gait kinematics that we would expect to see. And then what we can do is we could talk a little bit about, you know, each one. We don't have to go in depth. And then I had two papers um, that I posted earlier in the week sort of as adjuncts to what we were talking about on social media that were kind of germane, you know, to the whole discussion yeah. and sort of gives it, you know, credence. Yeah, let me, uh, before we go into that, I, you know, it's, it's funny when <clears throat> we talk about foot types, most people who aren't in geek land like we are, they think of foot types as pronated, supinated, or neutral. And that's pretty much, uh, you know, an infection that's been spread along by a lot of the shoe companies and shoe stores as well, because they've got your shoes for pronators, your shoes for supinators, and then your neutral shoes. And they've got the medial dual density stacked um, shoes for the pronators to stop them from pronating. They've also got the super feet and whatnot in the stores that they can sell to help with that. <clears throat> and they've got the shoes for the the opposite, the people who are supinating too much and, you know, a shoe, that, a shoe that's more flexible. And then they've got the neutral shoe that kind of, you know, fits the middle bill there. So most people, I think, when they're not in the field that we are, think that there's just basically three foot types. There's one normal one, the neutral, and then there's the outliers, pronation and supination. But we know, and we've talked about it here a zillion times, that it's degrees of pronation and supination and degrees of supination and pronation that um, are what brings out the necessity to have to know the different foot types and then to know what those characteristics are either locally in the foot <clears throat> and then which shoes to apply them for uh, or to which shoes to apply 
to those types of feet or of shoes and what happens actually when you apply the wrong shoe to the foot type i think that uh, one of the points that we hit home that was really important was that you can look at a foot either in the air evaluating it or you can have a, a static assessment on a foot plate or a foot you know either a uh, a foot mapping device or you know some of these foot scanners that some of the orthotic and shoe places offer but that doesn't tell you what the foot is actually going to do whether it's in the air or on the scanner on the ground or during motion it only tells you what what it looks like before it's loaded and the loading response is really where the truth comes out and where the problems begin and so you can have a certain foot type but I mean for example you can have a high arched foot that looks great and it looks like it's a neutral foot but as soon as you step on it, they they slam down into rear foot valgus and you know midfoot pronation. So it's often um, what happens and how it functions as opposed to some of the static assessments. And that's something we always try to hit home. Is is you know looking and seeing is one thing, but functioning is another. So we we put up some articles on social media this week. Um, why don't you fire off on those since you're the one to put them up? So. The first one, you know, was just the whole concepts of foot types. And some people kind of poo-poo the concept of a foot type. But like I mentioned earlier, it gives us a construct. It gives us a framework to hang stuff on. And um, if you're a linear guy like me, um, I like consistency. I like routine. I like constructs. I like rules. Because, you know, rules can be bent or broken a lot of times. But if we have the basic idea of what's supposed to happen or what's supposed to go on, it makes it that much better. So the first article I put up was the Schultz article out of um, uh, Journal of Applied Biomechanics. It was from 2016. And basically what they did is they looked at um, foot types. And they said, all right, so what variables out there? And they looked at all kinds of different variables with respect to the foot, navicular height, navicular differential, arch height, you know, et cetera. What variables are predictable and can be related to foot type? And what they found is there's basically uh, five that are, you know, clinically reproducible that give us a fairly good idea. And I know everybody wants to know what they are. Um, and anyway, w- what they found is these five characteristics are correct about 80% of the time, which is pretty good. 80% is, you know, a B plus or a B, at least a B um, as far as that goes. So the big things that mar- the, the, the primary variables are one, malleolar valgus. What that means is uh, they were talking mostly about the rear foot. In other words, how much does the rear foot turn out? In other words, how much rear foot valgus is present? The arch height index, and they did this while sitting, so it was high, medium, or low. Um, this kind of surprised me that they did it sitting and not standing, but just looking at the difference in height between uh, standing and sitting. Uh, three, first metatarsophalangeal joint laxity. In other words, how much movement is in the first ray? Can they descend that first ray? How much great toe extension do they have? Which we know, four foot rocker, is super important if you don't have that requisite amount, you know, minimum 50 degrees, we're looking for 65. If you don't have 50 degrees of great toe extension, you need to find a way to progress forward. So you're going to spin your foot out, you're going to spin it down, you're going to pick it up early, you're going to prematurely rise your heel, you're going to do something else. Um, And then the other one was maximum contact of medial longitudinal arch. In other words, they looked at midfoot pronation, pretty much. What did it look like sort of on a pedograph? And then they came up with secondary variables, and those were rear foot alignment, in other words, forefoot or rear foot to forefoot relationships, arch height in general, midfoot mechanics, as well as the you know whether the windlass mechanism was intact or not. So it was kind of cool because if you go to PubMed and you type in foot types, there's not a lot of literature that comes up. Um, and not a lot of information on that. Now, if you type in rear foot varus, there's more papers or rear foot valgus or, you know, forefoot or whatever. That's going to bring up more information on that. But it was kind of cool to see that. So I thought that that was neat because, and we put a slide up um, on our social media page that showed, you know, rear foot to forefoot relationship and, you know, what's your foot type? So that was the first one and really no rocket science or nothing super duper um, exciting going on there. But then the second article I put up, was about squatting. Now, we know we've got a lot of people out there that do squats. And what this particular study did is they looked at people's um, ability to squat and they looked at their foot mechanics with them in a neutral sort of foot, um, a foot with um, a medial canting. In other words, they took the entire foot and inverted it. 
or just some rear foot support. In other words, they put some support under the medial aspect of the calcaneus, much like an orthotic would. And they wanted to know, well, how did this affect squatting? And for those folks that want to know, it, it should be in the show notes for you. Um, this is uh, pa- Power and Clifford were the two authors. It's out of Journal of Human Kinetics. And I'll mention that it's a free full text, so there's absolutely no excuse not to get this article uh, downloaded and absolutely read the, um, the whole thing. So they came up with these certain conclusions here. You know, when rear foot alignment changes, the kinematics of the foot change. Well, you know, we've kind of been talking about that for the last five years. Um, So that really wasn't any surprise there. Um, If they took the surface that people was tilted into, and I want to talk about this for a second here, um, and and they tilted it into inversion, they put it into varus. Um, So basically a shoe that's medially posted or something like that. Um, This can change peak pronation. So we knew that it was going to change pronation, but this is kind of confirmation of that. So if you have somebody, and let's just say your goal is to shut down pronation, you could support the arch. We could you know, educate their muscles and stuff, but let's say they're resistant to that or we're looking for a faster fix, not fix, I should say, a faster solution to their symptoms. We could either support their arch or we could give them a higher de- a shoe which has higher density on the medial aspect, or we could take the entire foot and invert it, which is going to, you know, obviously rotate the knee outward a little bit, stop some of that medial knee fall, and slow down some of the pronation that's occurring. And we do this all the time with ski boots when we're trying to get people to um, have basically a flat ski. So um, if you have a flat ski, then it's easily it's easier to initiate and exit a turn. If you're on your inside edge, it's easy to initiate the turn, but when you have to exit the turn, I've got to get from that middle edge just to a flat ski and then go to the outside edge. So it's a lot more energy and things like that. So that was the second thing that they kind of um, talked about. And what they found is if you invert the rear foot, this changes ankle dorsiflexion or ankle rocker like we're talking about. So if I invert the rear foot, this reduces ankle rocker. In other words, ankle dorsiflexion. So now that got me thinking, and I'm sure this got your you know, juices flowing as well, Sean. You see somebody in an orthotic. You see somebody in a medially posted shoe. You see somebody that has an inverted you know, attitude to their shoe or it's worn into varus. Now I'm limiting ankle rocker. And if I limit ankle rocker, I'm limiting hip extension. If I limit hip extension, I can't get at my glutes. And you know the constellation of things that can happen once that happens. But I was, I was a little surprised to see that, um, that inverting this decreased the amount of ankle rocker. But likewise, it increased knee flexion. And at first I was like, what? But then that makes sense. If I take away motion in one area... Okay, I forget what it's called, but there's a rule where if you rob motion at one joint, it moves more proximally. Um, you've talked about that in lots of posts. I just can't remember the guy's name um, of what rule that is. But um, anyway, we're going to increase knee flexion. So we decrease ankle rocker, but we increase knee flexion. And the last thing, of course, that it changes is if I invert the rear foot, it is going to change the amount of hip abduction. Okay, and then that's going to change how much valgus you have in the knee. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to basically externally rotate that, which is going to affect abduction and reduce knee valgus. So not rocket science here, but interesting stuff um, as far as that, especially the change in ankle dorsiflexion with inversion of the foot. Um, I haven't really noticed this clinically, but I never looked for it. Um, How about you? Well, it is something that I check on my exam. You know, when I do check dorsiflexion, I try to do it in three positions. One where I know the nor- the normal. I start neutral, okay? So neutral ankle, and I go ahead and dorsiflex. Then I let the person pronate through the, f- the uh, rear foot or the midfoot or both, which is certainly pathologic uh, dorsiflexion. In other words, if they, had to pro- if they had to dorsiflex through the midfoot, how much would they do? This is going to be classic in your forefoot supinatus patients, your rear foot, val- rear foot valgus patients. And then I will fully invert the foot or supinate the foot, and I'll check dorsiflexion. I tend to think it's a little bit more honest, but you do lock up the lateral ligaments, and it brings up a really important point and a clinical phenomenon that I'm seeing more and more out there. 
I'm seeing a, a fair amount, at least enough that it's troubling, and I've had to go ahead and do some research online, uh, still having some voids in the information. So I'm still still troubled by some of these cases, but post ankle inversion injuries, usually which of of those are a plantar flexion and inversion type injury, so a massive supination event if you need a more simple lingo. Um, these clients tend to come in. I, I shouldn't say these. A small percentage of these patients tend to come in with an anterior medial uh, impingement syndrome at the. Um, talus and the navicular interval uh, I'm excuse, oh, I'm sorry not that interval the uh, tibio talar joint and they show nothing on the x-rays a lot of them show this little small fingertip sized soft tissue high intensity signal mass that has formed on that medial aspect of the joint you know it's similar to um, an impingement syndrome at any other joint where you're impinging one joint against the end range of another one and the literature tends to lean towards, and I'm going to put together a post on this at some point, that during that ankle inversion event, the medial aspect of that tibia slams into the synovial tissue, the capsule, cartilage, who knows, uh, on the talus, creating a proliferative effect and an inflammatory response, which for some people, for some reason, tends to form a soft tissue mass that creates then impingement even on normal ankle dorsiflexion. So it's interesting about the inversion supination that you were talking about of the foot as a whole and some of these issues here. Um, I just thought it was really interesting. It sparked that thought of the ankle impingement syndrome. And so it's, it's really critical that we look at these um, ranges of motion really, really clearly. And as even I said, and sorry for being repetitive over many podcasts on this, but it, it just because they have it on the table doesn't mean they're going to express it on the ground. Mm-hmm. If you don't have enough functional stability around a joint, even though it tests normal on the table, you're going to block it out with compensatory tightness, you know, uh, challenges in mobility and stability that may actually block out that range. So um, those are some initial thoughts. Uh, I always say that the knee is the symptomatic child or the most symptomatic one typically in the lower limb because it's just a simple sagittal hinge. And if you do tip that foot out too far into inversion slash supination, if you will, you have that risk of carrying that knee too far out into uh, the frontal plane or too far past sagittal, if we will, too far laterally which is always a risk. And um, it's certainly better than the alternative of letting it carry too far inwards, which you see in a lot of people who squat, who might have a rear foot type problem, as discussed here, that might actually provoke some knee issues there. So that issue is um, is certainly valid as well. So those are just some thoughts that, that kind of came around here. You know, we have to also remember that weightlifting shoes do have a higher than normal uh, heel drop the difference from the rear foot to the forefoot. So these people are relatively stacked in a slight degree of plantar flexion to begin with, which does buy you more ankle dorsiflexion if you need it, which helps you get to the bottom of your squat because a lot of people do have that deficit. So, so many variables here. That's why I love articles like this. They just make your head start to swim and put together bigger clinical pieces. So those are my thoughts. Then there's some pretty good thoughts. And if you think about that increased knee flexion, it's just going to take that talocrural articulation and it's going to, you know, mash it, much like we see dorsal exostoses at the first MTP joint when you have that last loss of ankle dorsiflexion, <clears throat> yeah, um, you know, in that area and that lock, loss of extension. So anyway, I just thought um, to me, you know, of course, being kind of geeky, but uh, that was something that was, um, you know, pretty interesting. And then the last paper I posted on was the Powers and Mafuchi paper out of JOSPT. And it's an old paper, 1995. But basically what they did is they wanted to say, gee, does the rear foot attitude affect people in uh, that have patellofemoral pain? And this led me to another paper um, that we'll talk about in a sec. But what they found is there's a small but significant increase in rear foot varus in the patellofemoral pain group um, compared to the control group in this particular study here. So they suggest that rear foot varus may be a contributing factor in patellofemoral pain. 
if we look at rear foot varus as a whole, now remember rear foot varus is where the rear foot is inverted with respect to the forefoot. And a lot of times it's going to occur, people have increased amounts of tibial varum, right? Curvature of the tibia, bow-leggedness, if you want to call it that. Normally we're looking for about four to six degrees. This is more. But with the forefoot being inverted with respect to the rear foot, to get that first met down, they have to pronate a whole lot through the forefoot. And a lot of these folks have relatively rigid midfoot. So as a result, the medial part of the tripod falls, and that causes medial spin of the lower extremity, and it brings the knee um, inside of the sagittal plane, which causes pressure. And if you think about, as I rotate the thigh internally, what that does, and, and I put the knee into more valgus, that puts the vastus lateralis at a greater mechanical advantage than the vastus medialis. And as a result of that, um, it appears that 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 could cause lateral movement of the patella or, you know, abnormal tracking um, in this particular area. So seeing that um, or having kind of confirmation of that um, was good. And it sort of exemplifies the whole forefoot varus um, thing. So there's there's another paper that... um, Oh, that's not the right one. Sorry, let me pull it out here. Uh, is this it here? Rear foot posture. So there's another one out of Journal of Sports Science and Medicine. This is more recent, 2004, looking at rear foot posture in individuals with patellofemoral pain syndrome. And what they found is the same thing. They had a small varus positioning of the subtalar articulation. And when they went to a, a standing posture, they became a little bit more uh, valgus. Because remember, like you were saying, the foot can look one way on the table and totally different when we weight bear it. Because all of a sudden we have these other factors. We have gravity, we have weight. In addition to that, we have the vestibular system um, and other things acting on that, which can totally change the position um, of the foot. So anyway, rear foot varus, patellofemoral uh, pain syndromes, there's probably some sort of a link there. And I see this a lot in the office, and I'm sure you do too. And you look at some people and you say, wow, this person was built to run. And I have patients that come in to see me that are runners, um, oftentimes, that weren't built to run. Their anatomy is much different, much like my own. I love to run, but uh, I have bilateral internal tibial torsion, bilateral femoral retroversion, and bilateral forefoot varus, or forefoot supinatus as a result of that. So um, my knees are outside the sagittal plane most of the time. And when I run and I run long distances, I get patellofemoral pain. And because of the collapse um, of the foot and my thighs rotating medially and not having enough range of motion, that motion gets taken up my lumbar spine. I get a lot of lower back pain. Um, I'm a way better biker, (laughs) you know, and Mm -hmm. that's because of the, you know, the tibial varum that I have present and everything else. It's just my body lends itself that much more to that. So it's kind of nice to see that there's a relationship here and that these foot types can... um, you know, can obviously uh, have a profound effect on mechanics. So to kind of review, people with rear foot varus, they're going to have a rear foot that's inverted with respect to the forefoot. A lot of times they have a cavus arch. They have increased tibial varum. They pronate a whole lot more through their forefoot. And um, in addition to tibial varum, oftentimes they have genuvarum. And I can't tell you a paper on this, but I can tell you clinically, when you see folks like this, a lot of times they have internal tibial torsion or way less external tibial torsion and limited internal rotation of the hips, often femoral retrotorsion. So those are those are things that I see. And we could talk about valgus in a sec, but I wanted to hear some of your some of your thoughts. Well, it's all real important stuff. I mean, I, I, I always love listening to you on this because you know, you've done this so many times it's just so so well postured in, in, in how you put it out there. Um, you know, it really comes down to the things that you and I have talked about all along. I mean, if the rear foot is too too um, varist, and, and, and you know, you you kind of want that. For you folks who, who this is not all that familiar with, you kind of want that rear foot to be neutral. I mean, it does strike a little bit on the outside. You strike on the outside of your heel a little bit, and then you come down a little bit medially right after that to get the medial facets of that talus down on, or the on the of the calcaneus down on the ground. And then that's what starts the pronatory effect of the talus sliding anteriorly on the on the facets there, and the in the midfoot starting to unlock and creating that pronation effect. So, 
It all comes down to starting in the right place. And the rear foot varus starts so far laterally that to get over to the big toe at toe off, you've got to move through these grandiose ranges of motion in the same amount of time that you normally would with your foot on the ground. So it's things are moving too much, too fast over the sh- same old normal short period of time. And so you have to move through these things a little quicker. And that's why these people tend to you know, develop a, a lot of medial foot pain and sesamoiditis and, and, you know, hallux and first ray type problems. And even some will form bunions because of the amount of excessive and abnormal loading of that medial ray, first big toe, first hallux type thing. So, and then moving upwards, you know, you, you're trying to keep this knee that's just a sagittal hinge moving forward. And that's in a perfect world where you don't have this tibial torsion or femoral torsion where the, the long bones don't have this pre-existing twist in them so you know for it just really kind of and then you have to figure out do you have enough glute to control the rate of spin you know the more rear foot varus you have the more supinated that foot is the more glute you're going to have to have to slow down eccentrically the rate of that internal rotation at least from the hip level so a lot of these things you've got to control at the bottom of this limb at the foot and at the shoe with orthotic and intrinsic footwork and extrinsic footwork and then you've got the work at the hip. And God forbid you've got to have a stable enough sp- pelvis and spine, you know, above that even. So, you know, it, for me, it just kind of really brings all of these issues together and shows people how complex this is and why a rear foot varus can be a real problem for some folks because it requires a lot of better than normal, maybe, you could say, um, control of spin and control of the weight-bearing load, at least mid-stance, uh, around the mid-stance area. So it's a real complicated foot type, as is rear foot valgus as well. It's kind of the opposite extreme. So why don't you go down that rabbit hole for a minute? So rear foot valgus is where the rear foot is everted with respect to the forefoot. So the foot's pre-pronated. So remember, pronation is dorsiflexion, eversion, and abduction, and the foot becomes a uh, mobile adapter rather than a rigid lever during... Uh, pronatory movements. It's one of the shock absorbing mechanisms that we have. So with rear foot valgus, what happens is the foot's in a pronated position. So that's fine for the first part from initial contact through loading response and up to mid stance. But the problem is you remain in pronation. So when the opposite foot comes into swing and you try to initiate supination on that stance face foot, it doesn't happen. It remains in pronation, which keeps the tibia, um, it keeps the tibia internally rotated at that level. And we remember the popliteus needs to contract at that point at a higher rate um, of speed um, to keep the femur externally rotating faster than the tibia is externally rotating. Otherwise, we start to macerate the meniscus. And what happens is that just that whole mechanism fails. And the knee has a tendency to buckle medially, oftentimes. We have excessive uh, internal rotation of the limb, and it remains an internal rotation. And if you put sticky dots on these people's knees and you watch them walk, a lot of times you, the sticky dot goes medially and never comes even to neutral or laterally again. It just doesn't happen. So the foot here is a very, very poor lever. And you had an excellent example of actually several of them for your office um, where you actually showed that. And you can just see that one poor lady that had a fixed, rigid rear foot valgus. You know, that's awful. And, and, you know, the other thing that we should mention here is these deformities are these foot types that are present a lot of times. Some are plastic and some are rigid. So if it's a rigid deformity, you can do things to help them, but your utility is going to be limited. Whereas if it's a plastic deformity, we can do a ton to try to alter that. Rigid deformities, in my experience, tend to often require an extrinsic device, such as an orthotic or something like that, um, AFO, whatever, to help to control or maintain that motion to get them back to an asymptomatic state, whereas um, plastic deformities, a lot of times you can get away. There's more fudge factor. There's a lot more room for improvement and strength. Now, that's not always the case, but that, I would say, is a general rule of thumb. And a caveat there, I mean, think, the, think about um, a rigid flat foot. One that doesn't form an arch when you raise the toes, you can't stick your thumb underneath it. This type of a foot doesn't need, although it looks like it needs a massive orthotic to crank up the arch, that foot won't go up. You won't get an arch out of it. So as I've always said, you know, you, all, you often need an extrinsic device, but you can't use a lot because if you do give them a really high arched orthotic, 
One, you're not going to get it made out of if you're doing it custom because you're not going to be able to get that foot into a high arch position to cast on a high orthotic. So you're going to have to use something, you know, kind of hodgepodge fudged, if you will, or something off the shelf. And if you get it too high of an arch in the orthotic, that is, and it's a rigid orthotic, they're going to feel like they're standing on, a, 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 you know, a, a, a golf ball. So these people need correction, but it has to be gentle. It has to be often somewhat flexible. And it has to be met often, I think you'll agree, with a, a nicely posted medial shoe, stability shoe, that gives them a little bit from the shoe itself so you don't need to buy as much from the orthotic, which can be a little offensive. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It just, uh, the whole thing makes me start to think about the last study we looked at and inverting the foot. Now, we were looking at taking the foot from neutral and inverting it further. What happens when we invert the foot from valgus to neutral? Are we still losing ankle dorsiflexion? Are we still losing first MTP dorsiflexion? Are we still gaining more knee flexion? And I don't know the answer to that question. You know, um, I haven't looked at that. But all of a sudden now, it's like, ooh. So like you said, we, we need to give them just enough to, I like to say, fill in the gaps. So in other words, when we look at orthotic therapy a lot of times, the difference between a footbed and an orthotic is a footbed creates a level surface for the foot. In other words, it brings the ground up to the foot, whereas an orthotic changes the mechanical function of the foot. And that's the main difference between the two. And some of these individuals, they may require more of a footbed than they do an orthotic. Exactly. exactly. In other words, right, ex exactly. So they might just need a level surface, a different type of shoe. Um, an inversion or eversion wedge. I mean, you know, orthotics will certainly improve biomechanical and kinetic function. You know, we've looked at that. We've done studies where we've looked at cyclists and things like that. So it will make changes there. And some studies show that it makes the, that foot function better biomechanically. But the question is, is that really what the person needs? And is that what's ultimately going to make them, you know, in quotes, better or end quotes. It might take away their symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be a really good thing. And for some people, that's all they want. They just, they want their symptoms gone. I mean, I see people that are coming out, you know, to Colorado to train for this race we have called the Leadville 100, which is a hundred mile. Um, it's an ultra marathon and it's in Leadville. So it's one of the highest incorporated, uh, if not the highest incorporated town in the United States, it's over 10,000 feet. So people come out here to train and, you know, I'll see people that'll come in with a raging Achilles tendonitis or plantar fasciitis three days before the race. And they're like, well, I need to be able to run 100 miles in three days, you know. And you're kind of scratching your head. You're like, well, yeah. all right, I'll do my best, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't make any promises here um, as far as what's going to go on. But a lot of times we will put those individuals in an orthotic. And we will change their mechanics enough for them to be able to finish the race. But that's not fixing them. It's taking their symptoms away and giving them a crutch that they can use so they can complete the race and, and reach their goal. And I try to make them understand that. It's like, look, you know, this is going to take away the symptoms and it'll work for a while, perhaps a long time. But ultimately, you're going to have to pay the piper sometime. And if you don't put the work in now, you're going to have to put it in later. And if you don't put it in later, you know, you're looking at more serious problems down the road. Yeah, and even another concept, just to show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Let's say you've got a rear foot valgus, and that goes with a foot that's pronating too much, too soon, too long. But it's still flexible, and you can put an orthotic in there. <clears throat> well, suddenly the body and you as the clinician, and even the client, says, hey, I like this infrastructure better. I like how neutral the foot is. I like that the foot tripod is more neutral. I like the fact that the ankle is sitting within the confines of that foot tripod triangle, just like you would have a camera sitting within the confines of the legs of the tripod. That's the goal is to get in a flat foot, trying to get that camera or the ankle, if you will, inside that medial aspect of the tripod between the rear foot and the, the, big, the big toe, the big knuckle, as I call it. Just because you make that correction with the orthotic or with an orthotic in a shoe or a footbed doesn't mean the muscles that were weak, 
that got the foot there, if it's acquired over time, which a lot of them are, it doesn't mean that the muscles are going to start to work. It just means that the infrastructure has been changed. It doesn't mean that anything else has actually functionally changed other than the platform. So you may have a whole bunch of muscle weaknesses that are still there to posterior attenuation or insufficiency, uh, weak medial gastroc and soleus, um, flexor halysis longus, abductor halysis, which we've talked about and may talk about today. It doesn't mean that those things are going to start to work again. It just means that the joint uh, configurations, the packing of the joint surfaces are going to be more appropriate for more neutral mechanics. But if you don't offer back those mechanical issues from the muscle components, you don't have a way to maximize stability and maximize mobility to the point where the person can actually function well. And so I often like to describe this to my patients as saying, just because that orthotic was put in your shoe by me or anybody else, doesn't mean that mean that the knee that's standing up there at the next, you know, the next floor up, isn't looking down going, okay, I like the platform better, guys. I like what you've done down there. The house isn't tipping into the ditch anymore, but you still haven't done anything to make functional changes so that I can actually figure out how to work better over the muscles that cross me. You have changed the platform, but all of these muscles that are still working across me may not actually be working. So now I may have to go into another subset of a compensation pattern. Now, flip of the coin, that doesn't necessarily mean that by repositioning the foot, you don't get activation of those muscles that might have been inhibited or challenged to the point where they endurance-wise fatigue or can't access normal length tension relationships to work. So that's where testing comes in. This is also where looking at the patient and seeing how they function putting them into orthotic for a week, having them come back in, do your muscle assessments, uh, muscle assessments again, look at the joint assessments. Are they actually improving their function? It's why Ivo uh, coined the term, and I love it, orthotic therapy. You need to be using this to help the person function better, not just improve their root basement foundational platform that's level um, from the get-go. It's nice to do that, but you have to also have to make sure that things work. And this is what drives me crazy when patients come in, got a new pair of shoes, they sold me a pair of super feet or whatever, and I'm good to go. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, you padded their bill another 40 bucks with the super feet. Whether you needed them or not, I'm not sure. Let's go ahead and have a look. First of all, are you in the right shoe? Second of all, do you need the super foot? Thirdly, does that super foot or whatever device you're using, I'm not, I don't have a problem with super feet. It's, it's, the, it's the end user that might not be using them correctly. Does that super foot or any other insert, does that change the normal function of the way that shoe was designed to change the function of the foot that's going in that shoe? So as we like to say, oftentimes the problem is not the super foot, not the orthotic, not the insert of the footbed, and it's not the shoe. It's the thing in all of these. It's you. It's the patient and maximizing their function, sometimes minimizing the amount of correction that you need. So there's another little rabbit hole for you folks. <laughs> yes, what a tangled web we weave. Yeah. So I had a case today, a um, little soft segue here. I mentioned this in a podcast a long time ago, I believe. Either that or I just ran it through a, a dream but I had another gentleman coming in with the same story that I'd had a long time ago. So I thought it's a little fun little thing here. I thought I'd share it just for a moment. I had another old guy come in. He came in with knee pain. And he's, we're taking the history and, you know, got all the information and, you know, what causes your problems, this, that. And then inevitably, so what do you do for activity? Oh, I'm very active. What do you do? Well, I cut the lawn and I walk. And I said, okay, those are called activities. That's not called exercise. And so I'm going to fine tune my, my question. What do you do for exercise? I go to the gym every day. We go to the gym every day, seven days a week? Yes, sir. Do you exercise there? No, I don't. What do you do there? I go to the sauna. I said, oh, so when you, you go to the gym, it's because you're going to the sauna. Okay, he was trying to convince me that somehow the fact that it was called a gym gave him that magic bullet that there's actually activity or exercise there. 
So, you know, the other, the, the previous story that I had told, this guy says, look, I, I go to the gym every single day. I don't know why I have this problem. And he was, again, he was the, uh, the sauna and hot tub guy. And I said, look, is that all you're doing there? Oh yeah, that's all I do. And then I shower and I come home. So, you know, I thought it was kind of a funny story. I, I realized you have to be a little bit more specific with your questions, Sean. So, and then I had <laughs> another gal come in today. And she says, look, every time I go bowling, I have this foot pain. And I just don't understand it. I mean, Dr. Allen, bowling, it's bowling. You don't break a sweat. It's not terribly difficult. I mean, how much does a bowling ball weigh, Ivo? Eight pounds, 10 pounds, 12? I don't know. I think it depends upon yeah. what size ball you use. Some okay. people use eight-pound balls. I think it goes all the yeah. way up to 16, but I'm not a bowling expert. So Yeah. And so she said, look, I, I bowl once a week, and I can't believe I'm in so much pain the next day uh, in my hip and in my foot and in my shoulder. It's just – I'm just bowling, and it's only for an hour. You know, uh, as she said, I don't break a sweat. It, I don't feel like I'm getting any exercise. I admit it's just an activity. So I said, so which hand do you put the bowling ball in? And she showed me it was her right hand. And I said, so stand on your left leg. She couldn't stand on her left leg. Her balance was horrible. <laughs> she had a pronated foot, and she's wobbling all over the place. She has no hip hiking ability. She has no proprioception. And I said, okay. So here we have a arm, which is yay inches long. I don't know, two feet, three feet, depending. And I said, you're going to put a 10-pound bowling ball at the end of this long lever, and you're going to swing it at a fairly decent you know, rate of speed. And you're going to be doing that while you're standing, while you've taken several steps and finally landed on your right, on your left foot, which you just showed me you have no stability in the foot, no proprioception on that side. And then you're going to hurl this ball while you're standing on this poorly balanced leg down into, you know, and so it just, it was a humor. She, you could see that she saw exactly where I was going. She was like, yeah, I can't stand on that leg and my knees buckling in and I got a flat foot and 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 then it came out, well, I wear orthotics, but I don't put them on my bowling shoes. And I was just like, oh, this is just, you know, it was it was amusing that clients just can't sometimes put things together. It's not their fault. I mean, there's many things in my life I don't put together that should be logical. But, you know, sometimes it's it doesn't have to be physical, rigorous exercise for you to be doing something that is rather simple, but requires a lot of fine-tuned, coordinated, detailed movement patterns in order to actually complete the function without you know, pillaging other joints in the body. So uh, that was my laugh for today. <laughs> I like it. I, I, I really dislike bowling because when you take a lumbar spine and you put it through flexion and torsion and apply a load, it's just a recipe for disaster, mm -hmm. particularly when you have to like wind it up and then decelerate it as you come through your bowling stroke or stride or whatever you want to call it. But, um, yeah, it's amazing. And something as simple as what you did with that gal, showing her that, um, you know, we do that kind of stuff all the time. We do it with skiers. It's like, okay, well, you know, stand on one leg, you know, can you do that? Okay, now, you know, tilt your knee to the inside, you know, simulating initiation of a turn or tilt it to the outside and they crumble. You know, because it's like if they're looking down, it's like, all right, well, do you look down when you ski? Oh, no, I'm looking down the hill. Well, I want you to look straight ahead because, you know, as well as I do, changing the position of the head is going to change how the muscles fire because we start to invoke cervical ocular reflexes as well as the vestibular system. So, yeah, it's it's the simple stuff a lot of times, you know, reproduce the conditions that are bringing about the symptoms. You know, it's, and I know you do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and by the way, to, to back up, yeah. I, I don't think I coined the term orthotic therapy. I think that was something that you and I both came up with because we're like, well, you need to change the prescription over time. Because if you're not, all you're doing is just going to keep giving them a stronger prescription and people are just going to keep getting worse and worse. So I, I think that was a joint venture. I, I don't think that was just me. <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't remember doing it. So I, 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 I thought it was genius the first time I heard it. So I'm pretty sure it wasn't me, but I'm not going to argue. Um, you know, you, you said something real important there, you know, breaking it down. And, you know, clients, they come in and look, I walk. I walk four miles a day and it's briskly. So it's not this activity that you always give us trouble with, Dr. Allen. You know, I'm, I'm out of breath. I'm like, okay, so it's a little bit more. Maybe it's, it's moderate exercise. Um, but I don't understand why I'm having this problem on this foot and problem on this knee. Um, and, and then I stopped them and I said, look, stand on one leg, 
and do a little lunge, you know, just a little mini lunge, you know. So you stand on your left leg and you swing your right leg forward and do a lunge. And then you swing that leg backwards and you do a lunge. You're just kind of doing these air, air leg swings forward and backwards while you're lunging on the one leg. And then you have them do it on the other. And inevitably one side is worse than the other. And then, I, and then you know, you look at maybe their foot control and can they form an arch and a tripod maintain stability over there. And you show them and they eventually see it. Hey, I'm having troubles on this side doing that. My balance is horrible and I'm collapsing my foot on the other side. And I said, look, you have problems in your gait because you're breaking down these fine motor patterns, but you don't notice a lot of these these deficits. I mean, most people who have a standing single leg balance challenge, they don't express it when they're walking because the acceleration and the steady acceleration or, or, or movement through the sagittal plane moving forward, you're always on that bad leg half the time and then you're on your good leg half the time, but you're, you're transitioning through the sagittal environment or sagittally through the environment. You're not, and because you're moving forward, you tend to dampen the frontal plane movements. We've seen this in our, what we call the three second walking test. We have a patient it, like walk like they're in slow motion, taking, you know, standing on the right foot and counting one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000 as they progress the other foot or other leg through that, through the swing phase. And then that leg is down on the ground or foot is down on the ground and then they swing. So it's a very slow motion walk and you see all of these, um, uh, frontal plane challenges and arm swings and knee corrections and foot pronation corrections. I mean, the same thing you'd see if you put someone on an, an air pad or a BOSU ball. You see all these checking motions. Those types of things happen. Um, they happen at a very small rate. And when we move through a sagittal plane and even quicker when we're running, you don't see these little things, but they're there. And over tens of thousands of steps in a day or t tens and tens of thousands of steps during a running week, those little things do play out over time. And it's those little things that often lead to the plantar fascial strain, the tib posterior tendonitis, or, you know, the little sharp jabs in the Achilles. You know, these things are additive. They happen over time. And so when these patients, I try to, and I hope that those clinicians out there that are listening do the same thing, that show the patient what they can't do in a very controlled static environment. And then try to express to them that those things are still happening when you're moving or you're in your sport, but they're dampened because you're moving through a plane of motion. But they're still there, and we still have to figure out how to control them and dampen them and improve your ability to stabilize a joint and yet still maintain a satisfactory amount of mobility. So really important stuff and dialogues that patients really appreciate, I find anyways, when you go down into the more detailed things because they don't understand why I can't just walk around the block and not have problems? Well, because you can't stand very well. And I don't know if you have any more comments on that, but, you know, there's the new thing that's come down the pipeline over the last couple of years, and it's these standing desks. And every client that comes into my office seems to think that standing desks are the answer to their problems of sitting. And I said, well, it's going to solve some problems, but I have a standing desk, and I always show patients that my standing desk doesn't face my client's chair. So I kind of stand at the desk with the computer kind of on the, the on an angle on the corner while I look over my left shoulder and listen to them and then I look back and type and look at them and then look back and type. And I show them, look, in order to do that, I have to pitch way out on my right hip and stand on the outside of my right leg. I don't have to, but often I do. And I said, look, I can stand very poorly for 30 minutes and still develop some hip problems because I'm jockeying that acetabulofemoral joint into a position where I'm creating some impingement or, you know, strain or ligamentous creep in the, in the capsule or the glute medius on that side. So standing desks, it's just like anything else. It's not a fix, just like an orthotic isn't a fix. You know, you've all heard my example. You're going to throw a stone in your shoe and it'll change the way you actually weight bear. It doesn't mean it's the right answer for you. You know, it's certainly cheaper than an orthotic. It's a little more it's a little less predictive than an orthotic, but a standing desk isn't an answer to all of your sitting woes either. You can stand with really bad posture, slouched shoulders and looking down and do all of the, a lot of the bad things that you do sitting. So again, you need to work on posture even in a standing desk. And so a lot of my runners are tending to go in that direction. I said, look, it's not a solution to all your problems. You still have to earn some postural changes there. So are you guys getting a lot of those, uh, a lot of clients coming in saying, oh, I need a standing desk. Can you write a script for this and that? You know, I use a standing desk personally, and um, 
I probably sell a lot of standing desks, not that I sell them through my office, but just for people in general, because they have such poor posture in their chair or ergonomically. But I, you know, always tell people, look, you need to sit for a while, you need to stand for a while. And people are like, oh, well, I sit on a ball all day. I'm like, oh, well, that's great. You know, you probably have really bad posture for most of the day because how long can you really keep your abs and everything engaged? You know, at best, maybe an hour, maybe. Um, yeah, if maybe. you can even do that. Maybe. And I'm talking about the extreme case. Um, but I think standing desks on a whole are a great idea. And I always encourage people to stand up, move around, walk around, just like I do. Like if you ever see me lecture, and you've seen me obviously, but um, other people, I'm standing up 90% of the time walking around. The only time I sit down is when I get tired, you know, and that's usually towards the end of the day after I've been lectured for eight or nine hours straight. Um, and then I'll sit down and talk for a little bit. But standing has... Standing has so many other advantages for us um, as far as activating different parts of your brainstem and increasing your cognition and increasing your ability to think. Um, it's just, you know, there's so many advantages to that. Um, you know, sitting is okay, but only for short periods. And, you know, your seat has to be proper. You know, you got to have the right support. Your feet need to be on the ground. There's so many factors um, involved. And, you know, you need a seat back. You know, you don't want to try to sit all day, especially if you're leaning forward without any kind of support because your muscles get tired. You know, it's uh, it's aerobic respiration, you know, and you can only go for so long till you run out of ATP and then you start to go through anaerobic glycolysis, you know. So it's there, there's a lot to it. There's a lot. Yeah, what to did it. McGill say? I don't know. What, what, was, what was McGill's time frame on that? Was it 10 minutes or 20 minutes before the paraspinals start to fatigue? Do you remember? You know, I don't actually remember, but I've, I can remember seeing the graph <laughs> up on the screen when I was watching him talk. But, it, mm. you know, it wasn't like hours. Yeah, I don't it, think it was more than 20 wasn't. minutes before you need some type of assistance, Yeah, if I recall correctly. Um, that wouldn't surprise me at all, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, good podcast. I don't know if you have anything else you want to talk about. I know there's some Halix abductus uh uh, our hallux, um, abductus hallucis muscle articles, but we can always talk about those next time if you want. You know, I think that might be a good topic because, boy, that really brings us down a big rabbit hole um, as far as talking about the anatomy of that. And then there's some studies looking at strengthening of that and the effect on bunions as well as arch height um, and things like that. So I think maybe we, we leave that for another time because that's probably another long rabbit hole. Uh, for us to go down. So everybody bring your headlamps um, next time around so that we can uh, head down there and look at all of that stuff and maybe mm -hmm. dive a little bit deeper and uh, do that. But hopefully we've um, we've enlightened you a little bit more about rear foot varus and valgus and some of the things associated with that. You know, I know when I was first learning about foot stuff lots and lots of years ago, uh, that stuff was always really puzzling to me. And Understanding and appreciating all of the things that are going on really made a huge difference for me personally as far as um, clinically being able to evaluate patients and sort of know, not always, but a lot of times what to expect or what sort of mechanics you could predict um, as to what's going on. But, you know, there's always the fake out and the red herrings. We see those all the time. So, Hey, I wanted to mention something to our listeners before I forget, and, and, and I probably will forget on future podcasts, but... Um, and this is kind of going to the forefoot, which really wasn't the, the, the gist of what we were talking about today. But, you know, we get a lot of folks in our office, I'm sure you do too, and listeners do as well, people who have a painful bunion, painful first metatarsal joint, um, turf toe. Uh, they may actually have a, uh, a post-operative bunion that might have a hallux elevatus or something like that. So these people are having troubles towing off. And I've been using more and more the Hoka, H-O-K-A, -A, uh, the Hoka running shoes. And they now have two different categories of shoes that has both a early stage meta rocker and a late stage meta rocker built into the shoe, uh, meaning a rocker bottom either at the early stage of uh, stance phase, uh, early stage of late mid stance, or a late stage meta rocker, meaning right over that 
right underneath the metatarsophalangeal joint. And I've been playing around with these with clients with those types of problems, and I've been having great success. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Holka shoes, they've got a very, very high stack height. So there's a lot of rigidity built into the shoe. So they had to put a very high rocker on the front of the shoe, a real beveled edge. But then they add these meta rockers into the shoe. And I can't tell you how many clients that it has been the absolute godsend simple fix you look like a genius prescribing this shoe sean to this client who has been everywhere who's got orthotics and this and that and just go try the shoe on and they literally walk out of the store and they can walk and they don't have any pain certainly doesn't fix the problem but some of these are fixed problems anyways um uh, fixed meaning they're 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 permanent so but sometimes it's just nice to get that shoe in there to help ease their pain so that you can get them off of you know some of the compensation patterns that are driven off of a painful toe off response because often you pay in the opposite knee or hip because of that so i've been using that holka shoe you can go on their site in fact you just go into google and just type in holka shoes um meta rockers and they will actually pull up a, a page if i recall correctly that talks about their two stage two stages of meta rockers and which shoes fall into that category i thought that was pretty sweet so i thought i'd throw that out to the listeners before we close shop here today sounds good all right well folks thanks for listening in uh thanks to our sponsor newbalancechicago.com <coughs> And if you're interested in sponsoring our show, please reach out to us. And in a very short time, in fact, it may even be up already, please go and check on our website. We are setting up a Patreon account, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. There should be a button on there, and that's for you folks who you know, say to yourselves, my gosh, these guys provide so much valuable material. They barely make us pay for anything. Only the courses that we choose to download to do these podcasts for free. They're writing articles. I've learned a lot from them. I've learned maybe, we hope that you guys say this to yourselves, I've learned more from them than I have in my clinical course in school. I'd like to throw them a couple bucks, five bucks, ten bucks, five thousand dollars. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, you know, as a little bone here or there to help us get through because we take a lot of time out of our personal lives in the clinic in order to do some of this stuff. Plus, we've got servers and we've got, you know, accountants and attorneys and we've got uh, Dropbox and we've got SoundCloud and we've got, I mean, the list goes on of all these little chunks of things, Libsyn servers and whatnot that we have to have, plus our websites. It's not a free venture on our end. Uh, it does cost us and it'd be nice to have a little bit of help on that. You know, we do take a bump on a lot of these things just because I think, Ivan, I think that this is really important stuff to put out there and we're trying to make our contribution to the clinical world. But if you feel like uh, you know, you're feeling generous at the end of this podcast or at the end of reading a blog post and you want to just throw us a little something to say thanks, we would certainly really appreciate it. It would certainly help the cause and keep us around a little bit longer. So that's it. So again, New Balance Chicago is our sponsor. We want to thank them. And until next time, Sean Allen in Chicago. Ivo Whirlup in Dillon, Colorado. We will see you in the shoe aisle.